grace, that unconditional love of God, mercy, the patient love of God, and the Holy Spirit be with you all through faith in Jesus Christ, because through faith it belongs to you. Amen. We just sang him 203. And I'll bet you, you sang it, and I'm wondering if you really looked at the words there. And I don't think that you really know the background for him 203. Because this was at a time, it's written by Martin Luther. And the Turks, which are the Muslims, were coming in and storming Constantinople. And there was a great fear in which all of this was going to come tumbling down. But there is, wherever there is a dark side, there's a bright side. Because of this, they had to take away the focus they had on Martin Luther because he was a wanted man. They had to redirect their attention to the Muslims who were coming and storming through there. So Luther was then taken and whisked away to the Wartburg Castle where he was able to take the time, translate the Bible into the German language at that time. So if you go back through that hymn 203, you will also notice <clears throat> that those words are directed to the fact that there was real danger afoot. Now we're coming to that point of the wonderful text that we have in front of us, that wonderful word of God that was expounded to you last week. Very good. But you realize that we are really in difficult times because we recognize that already Satanism has been recognized as an official religion. We also already have Wiccan chaplains in the military, and there you have it. And now we also have recognized that the Supreme Court has gone ahead and they have then trashed the traditional definition of marriage, which was scriptural, one man, one woman. As a result, now you can have same-sex marriages. One woman with another woman, one man with another man. But that doesn't end there. What is going to continue now is the fact that there's going to be multiple mates. Isn't that something? So you're going to have two or three men, two or three women. It doesn't stop there. It also is going to continue to <coughs> with polygamy. And that's going to be the big next thing that's coming down the pipe here in so far as our whole country is concerned. And so what we're going to have here is going to be absolutely atrocious. You see, when this is opened up to the classical Pandora's box and Satan is going to have a heyday here and everything, and like the state of Washington, you can rest assured it's going to be introducing to bestiality as well. We have quite a time ahead of us, a challenging time. It's going to be something like in the days of Luther. And so here we stand and we recognize the fact, yes, boy, we've really got something going for us, haven't we? And we know that the Islamics, the ideology therein, is really surging the head. I go back, way back into history, to the Coptic Christians in North Africa. And they were very content with what they had. They were a strong Christian group. They didn't think it was necessary to reach out and touch other people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This matter of, of finding souls that were sliding down the precipice into total destruction and eternal death. And so they thought, no, we're content. We like the traditions we have. We like what we got. Why should we go out there and do anything like that? Only at the same time, Mohammed was gathering his horses together and ran roughshod all over North Africa, which is all Islamic today. And so when we begin to look at that, we see that, yes, we are in difficulty today as well dealing with the ideology of Islamism as such. Then I'll bring this right back to the text, and I want to now read some of the passages. You had it all last week, so 
I'm not going to repeat it. And if you were following the meditations, you follow through every day of the week, right? <coughs> With the same text continually. So I will just read the beginning here. That they, we're coming to our theme, actually, honest. And that is the privilege of serving Christ. Did you ever think of the privilege? Did somebody ask you to serve? Did you say, oh, no, not again. That's why some people like to join large congregations because they can hide. What do you think of that? But anyway, it is a privilege to serve Christ. Now listen to this. Way right back before time began, before the sun, the moon, and the stars, before the earth, way back then, God elected each one of us to be his child, to be his servant. Isn't that marvelous? And when you were baptized, that was a confirmation of your divine election. You were baptized, and the Holy Spirit embedded in you the gift of faith, so that you could take Jesus as your Savior. Now let's go to our text here. And this is the parable of the two sons that we had last week as well. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Can you hear the arrogance of this young man? I will not. And then at the same time, we realize that he goes ahead and wants. He says, oh, yeah, right. He houses me, he clothes me, he feeds me, so why? The vineyard is his problem. And I'm just wondering about that as we look at it. The vineyard, what is that? That's the kingdom of God. The vineyard is where you and I have been called to serve. Hmm. How are we doing? I don't know how you, if you know how Wisconsin Synod got started. Way back, probably in the late 1700s, going into the 18th century. And we recognize that there's a bunch of Germans that came over here, and some English too. But they didn't have any churches. And so they had home devotions. Fathers would have to teach their children. And then there was the Rhineish mission in Germany, and they said, you know, we've got to get over there and gather them together and get them organized. And so they sent some pastors over. They landed in New York and Maine and so forth, and they went to <coughs> Philadelphia, Ohio, Iowa, up into Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. They started gathering people together. And lo and behold, they finally got organized to a point and there was called the Minnesota Synod, the Wisconsin Synod, the Michigan Synod, all the different states had a synod. But these men that came from the Rhineish Mission were not exactly well taught, and they did not have a confessional position per se. And so we, we got started off with rather a liberal group as such. At the same time, we recognize C.W. Walter with three shiploads of people coming from Germany landed in USA and they all gathered in the state of Missouri, thus the Lutheran Church of Missouri Senate. And he, Walter, was a strong confessional Christian and established seminaries and congregations with that background. And with Wisconsin being as liberal as it was, Walter finally got a hold of them and said, you know, this is not really the route that, that you should travel. We should come back to God's will. And so as a result, we became concerned about getting back into God's will and doing exactly what he said. So we certainly have to thank the Lord for men like that that had directed us back. Out of Missouri Synod came the teachings of fellowship, principles as such, and Walter divine those. And then in 1959, 1958-59, my professor and president of the seminary, Carl Lovrens, took
took those principles of fellowship and formed them into the Wisconsin Synod. And thus we have the fellowship principles of the day. And he was the one that said, I am pre putting this forward in order that we can have an umbrella for all those who love God's word to come under that umbrella and to be able to embrace God's word and have that wonderful fellowship with one another. And now today what has happened I was trained at Missouri Senate, and then Wells asked me if I would come up to that one for the last year and take my training there, which I did. And I've been blessed both in Missouri Senate, I have been blessed in Wisconsin Senate. Ever so much. The one thing that Missouri had going for it at that time when I was there was the fact that their whole curriculum was based, or mission-oriented, I should say, reaching out. Every subject we had was reaching up, and we were well trained in that. When I came up to Mequon in Wisconsin, there was nothing that was dealing with reaching up. Not a thing. You couldn't find a book in the library except way back in the 1800s that had something on missions. And so I talked to Professor Bloomy, and he mentioned to me, well, we just went through that, and I said, I missed the paragraph, I don't know where it was. And he said, okay. So he gave me a check for $500, that was back in 1959, 19, yeah, 1958, 59. That was a lot of money. And then I went and I purchased books on evangelism and missions and so in the seminary. Today, our seminary is producing men that are supreme that are super, mission-minded, ready to go. Their hearts are on fire to reach out to people who are not in church, who are in the darkness and the shadows of unbelief. It is marvelous. We have a wonderful faculty there. They're fantastic individuals. How wonderful that all is. It's just absolutely marvelous. Now when I come to this, that we recognize, okay, what am I going to do? Missouri Synod was on fire today, they're not. In 1961, they separated Wells and Missouri Synod. And that was a sad day for me. I was in Africa at the time. And I really felt badly because I had a lot of love for the professors that taught me. But in any case, they went the wrong way. They made a choice. They became liberal. They had abandoned that which C.W. Walther had established. And now we recognize, you know what? We've been leaning on Missouri Synod for mission work all the while. We haven't done anything. We have the Apache field. And we just began in 1953 the exploratory work of both Pastor Henneke and Pastor Walters who went to Africa and did some exploratory work there. And so, how interesting is that? And then in the 1962 conventions, they said, you know what? We're in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota. What about the other states? So then they were determined to reach out into all 50 states to establish a confessional Lutheran congregation. And now we're there. And they were on fire. At first they said, I want. And then they repented and came back and said, we will. And they got on fire. And they went. And now it sort of seems like even though that we have the men coming out of the seminary that are really gung-ho for the Lord, congregations aren't. Why is that? They say, yes, I'm ready to serve. And then, what do we say? I don't know what to say if I'm going to talk to somebody. <clears throat> what has the Lord done for you? What has our God in heaven, why did he commission his one and only son to come into this world? To be conceived by the Holy Spirit. To be formed in the womb of a virgin. <clears throat> To be delivered like you and me. 
to live in a world and walk among men, to recognize the challenges, the temptations that are all there. And everyone has to be faced. And he suffered all of that, even to the point of recognizing how impossible it was for you and me to live up to the Mosaic law, and that we stumbled and fell continually. And here we are called from eternity to serve our Lord. What a privilege to serve. You recognize how marvelous that is to be called and said, serve me. It is absolutely incredible. Now I want to read here from this other part here, this other son. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Oh boy, how often does that happen? Huh? <coughs> did he hear of the hypocrisy that's involved there? I will go. Without even thinking that he would ever walk into that vineyard. His father's mission field, white unto the hearts. And so he asked, you know what? But do you think which one of the sons is the most pleasing? Well, the first one, because he repented. Oh, he didn't get friend. He repented. My goodness, yes. What does that mean, repent? Have you ever thought about that? Okay, we're going to come to the Lord's table today. We're going to repent of our sins. <coughs> what does it really mean? Do we sort of mealy mouth and say, I'm sorry? <coughs> is that it? We recognize the first thing we have to do is to look at the fact that to know the sins we have committed. Recognize it. Then the next thing is, do I really want to get rid of that? Are there some sins that you really favor? <laughs> I'll say I'm sorry today, but then tomorrow I'll be right back at it. Do we recognize a sin and then we go ahead and hate that sin? Because that's part of repentance. They hate that sin that we have committed. Our sins that we have committed, our Heavenly Father loathes. He hates that sin. Because we poured it and piled it on his one and only son when he went to the cross. There he shed his blood for us. Not only do we recognize the horrific human suffering he had to endure, but worst of all was the fact that he was being rejected by his father. And he did this all because he loved us with that unconditional love. He doesn't want you to suffer hell. There is a hell. You know that. We're doomed for that hell. Except for the grace of God. Manifested in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. How marvelous is that? So when we come and repent, it is a matter of saying, yes, I'm a sinner. I was conceived in sin. I lived in sin. I live in among a world of sin. This is Satan's kingdom. How can I get escaped? We stumble, we fall, indeed we do. And yet here we have a Savior. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there are those who say, I got my, money, my pocket full of money, I don't need him anymore. You're not alive, if that's the case. You're dead in transgressions and sins, unless Christ is in us and we in him. Then we have life. How marvelous is that? And how wonderful it is that we are able then to know that we are alive in the Savior because we recognize the wonderful love God poured out on all of us. The first son, he repented. And then he went to work. The second son said, I will. But then he went the way of the world. You know, there was a time, wasn't there? 
You went through catechetical instructions of God's word. How marvelous. Maybe, what, one year, two years? Three years? I know I went three years. Oh my. How marvelous. And then we came to the day for our confirmation. And, and you also had an examination. And you probably were so worried over that. And then finally comes his confirmation. Do you remember your confirmation vow? Let, let me read it to you. Are you willingly, faithfully, ready to conform all your life to the rule of the divine word? How are you? To be diligent in the use of the means of grace. Lord's Supper, hearing the word. To walk as it becomes the gospel of Christ. How's our behavior? And then it goes on, and in faith, word, and deed, to remain true to the triune God, suffering all, even death rather than to fall away. How about that? Have we thought about that? You know, actually, your confirmation vow, we call it confirmation for what? It's a confirmation of your baptismal vows. I don't know how much you think about your baptism, but your baptism is so extremely important. You've become a child of God. That miraculous happening with the Holy Spirit through the water embeds that faith in your heart so that you recognize Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And on your confirmation day, you are confirming that vow your sponsors and parents made. How marvelous is that? You see, this is so very important in our life as such. And I'll tell you this, as we go ahead and take a peek at all the stuff that we're doing here, we daily sin much, don't we? There's sometimes we don't even know that we're sinning. And we fall into sin, don't we? I know. I know it only too well. From kindergarten through eighth grade, I went to a Christian day school. Then I got wrapped up in the 101st Air Force. Then the 82nd Infantry Division. Trained as a scout. Uh, went to University of Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. And then when I got out of service, I didn't do anything. Just fell away. How about that? I was the guy that said I will, and then I didn't. Then the Lord, by His grace alone, directed my steps back into the church. And it got so turned on, I had to leave my position in the board of company and study for the ministry. And I can't tell you what a privilege I discovered it is to serve our Lord and Savior. How marvelous that is. And I have never regretted it one moment in all my life to be here and to study. I wonder how many times you have fallen and stumbled in God's house. And we are able to go ahead and sing our praise to Him and worship Him and we'll come to the Lord's table to partake and receive and let the body and blood of our Lord be ingested in us to have Christ in us. What a communion that is, isn't it? How fantastic. That we can serve. But you know what happens. We come to that point where I'm so used to sinning, I just keep on doing it. We call it perpetual sinning, don't you know? we? Do you know, if you're working with your hands, what happens? You get calluses on them, don't you? You get, they get, cells begin to die, and you get these calluses and stuff. And, you know, you can really slap, slap things around, and it doesn't hurt. It's the same way with our souls. We keep on sinning. They become callous. They die. We don't think sin is so terrible anymore. Not only are we in the broad path to destruction, 
who has lost the wonderful privilege of serving our Lord and Savior. And I can't think of anything better than doing that. Because there is where the joy is. The opportunity to feed on Christ. To be lifted up by Him. Oh yeah. Still stumble, still fall, still sin. We run right back to Jesus, don't we? And he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. How marvelous is that? How wonderful is that? That indeed, we have a Savior that loves us in spite of ourselves. It's so great. So we don't want to do that. We think back in the scriptures and we know how often we think back to Abraham, the land of, from the city of Ur, the land of the Chaldeans, where he was called and told to go. And he didn't even know where he was going. He just went. He and Sarah. And he promised them that through his seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed because the Savior would come through them. So he had Jacob. Yeah, Isaac. And then we realize the Lord tested him to sacrifice him. But the Lord spared him at the last moment. And now we see all the generations that followed Abraham that they were the children of God. Wasn't long, was it, that we recognized that there were the sons of Jacob and they then suffered a famine. They came up into Egypt, and that's where the son Joseph, that was despised, sold into slavery, then rejected, then despised, and thrown into prison because of Potiphar's wife. Thirteen years he was there. And then the Lord called him out. Because he was able to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. And he became the prime minister of Egypt. Then he called the whole family up into Egypt and to the land of Goshen. There they multiplied. And any time that we multiply, that's a blessing of God. And there were many of them to the extent that Pharaoh was worried about the number of, of Jews that were there. The Hebrews were way too many. So they tried to abort them whenever they could. Now the Lord heard their cry, even though that they were following some of the idol worship in Egypt. He heard their cry, he came, and there was a grand exodus. He opened up the Red Sea, and they passed through and dry land, and the army of Pharaoh that followed was all drowned. They got into the wilderness, and there there was approximately two and a half million people. When Moses went up on the mount, he came down and here, what were they doing but worshiping the golden calves? You see how quick it is to fall. You marvel at this again and again. How can these people with so many blessings fall? Well, how come we have so many blessings and we fall? How come we have had such a wonderful upbringing in our life and then we throw it away at times? Why do we do that? It's that sinful nature which we have inherited. How sad is that? And yet God loves us with an everlasting love. Then he lets the children of Israel to go into a land with the vineyards that they didn't plant, the wells that they did not dig, and the houses that they did not build, and they had it all driving out the nations before them, only then to become callous again and following the idolatry of the nations that they drove out. If you want to see a mere image of our country, that's it. We have been blessed beyond measure. And now we are simply going away in every which way. Oh my. Yes, I went to the University of Wisconsin. We had President Shaleva there, and she introduced the political correctness factor taken right out of the book of Marx. How about that? And today... You are afraid to say anything out in public because it's not going to be politically correct. How dare we be the son that says, I will and then we don't. 
Are we not to obey God rather than man? Are we not to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth? Indeed we are. I think of this. Are we losing our privilege? We still have our churches open. What can we do? Is there something we can do? Oh, there is, dear people, there is. Remember, you were called from eternity, right? Before there was even any kind of planets, any kind of sun, moon, star, without the earth. Back in, before time began, God called you. And your calling was confirmed at your baptism. How marvelous is that, dear people? Here we are today. And we ought to obey God rather than man, don't you think? What a joy it is to serve Him. What can we do? Well, I'm going to tell you one thing that we can do. It's a very simple thing. And that is that we get back into God's Word. We have private devotions. We have family devotions. If you say you're too busy for it, there's something wrong. Because this is your vocation. Your work is your education. So we get back into the Word of God. And there we'll begin to recognize the wonderful love that God has poured out upon us. What does it say in 1 Peter 2 9? You are a chosen nation. A royal priesthood. What does that mean? Oh, I've been dressed up in all these beautiful robes. No. What it means, your royal priesthood, is that you are the high priest that serves the king of kings. What a privilege to serve. You follow that? Isn't that marvelous? <coughs> and I know that some of you are really diligent, diligent servants of the Lord. And there are some of us who don't. But we have a privilege and we need to do that. What has he given us? I'll tell you what he's given us. Not only are we the children of God, but also at the same time, we are His servants. And He has given us the tools. He has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven that whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you bind or don't forgive are not forgiven. You have a mighty, mighty tool. And we are to use that to His glory. Exercising the same love that he has shown to you and to me. We have the word of God. We have it printed out. You can buy any amount of Bibles. It's inexpensive. We can pick it up and we read it. You can get it on tape. You can get it on a DVD. We can hear that word. We can imbibe that word. We can let that word of God live in us. Oh dear people. Can you recognize the privileges that we've got to serve? I think you do. And I hope you will. Beginning with your family. Beginning with your friends and your neighbors. And share with them what God has done to you. How much love he's poured out into your heart. Tell me. Do you really believe that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, in this world? Do you believe that He's empowered us with immeasurable power? That all our sins are forgiven? That Christ Jesus came into the world and carried those sins and now we're robed in His righteousness by faith in Him? Do we believe that we have the words and the all, the very keys to the kingdom of heaven? If so, then say amen. 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 Thank you. <coughs> and now the peace of God that transpired before all others. Wisdom and knowledge, even with the angels of men, be yours. That peace in Christ Jesus. Amen.